Three Lives Written by T. Lobsang Ramper Narrated by Michael Sharp To my friends Eric Tetley and Tetley Teabag's Cat Forward This book is not presented to you as fiction for a very special reason. It is not fiction. Of course, we can readily agree that some of the words in the book about life on this world are artistic license, but accept my statement that everything about the life on the other side is definitely true. Some people are born with great musical talent, some people are born with great artistic talent. They can paint and captivate the world. Other people may be highly gifted through their own hard work and assiduous devotion to study. I have little in the material side of this world, no car, no television, no this and no that, and for twenty-four hours a day I am confined to bed because, for one thing, I am paraplegic, no use in the legs. This has given me great opportunity for increasing talents or abilities which were granted to me at birth. I can do everything I write about in any of my books, except walk. I have the ability to do astral travel, and because of my studies and, I suppose, because of a peculiar quirk in my make-up, I am able to astral travel to other planes of existence. The characters in this book are people who have lived and died on this world, and because of special provisions, I have been able to follow their flights into the unknown. Everything in this book about the afterlife is utterly true, therefore I will not label this book as fiction. Lobsang Rampa Chapter 1 who is that old geezer? Leonidas Manuel Molly Gruber slowly straightened up and looked at the questioner. Eh? he said. I asked you who is that old geezer? Molly Gruber looked down the road to where an electrically propelled wheelchair was just going into a building. Oh, him, said Molly Gruber, expertly expectorating upon the shoe of a passing man. He's a guy that lives around here, writes books or something. Does a lot of stuff about ghosts and funny things, then he does a lot of writing about people being alive when they're dead. He snorted with superior knowledge and said, That's all right, you know. Not a bit of sense in that rubbish. When you're dead, you're dead. That's what I always say. You get then their priests come along and they say you've got to do a prayer or two, and then perhaps if you say the right words, you'll be saved and you'll go to heaven, and if you don't, you'll go to hell. Then you get the Salvation Army come along. They make a hell of a racket on a Friday night, and then fellows the likes of me have got to come along with our little barrows and sweep up after them. They're there yelling and banging their tambourines, or whatever you call the things, shoving them under the noses of passers-by, screeching out they want money for the work of God. He looked about him, and blew his nose on the sidewalk, and then he turned to his questioner again and said, God? He never done nothing for me, never. I got my own bit of sidewalk here, which I gotta keep clean. I brushes, and I brushes, and I brushes, and then I take two boards, and I picks up the stuff and puts it in me barrow, and every so often we get a car come along, well, we call them cars, but they're really trucks, you know, and they come, and they takes my barrow, and they upends it with all the stuff inside, and all the stuff is taken away, and I've got to start all over again. It's a never-ending job, day after day, no stopping. You never know what councilman is coming by in his big flash Cadillac, and if we ain't bed over our brooms all the time, well, I guess they go along to somebody in the council, and that somebody makes a racket with my boss, and my boss comes down and makes a racket on me. He tells me, never mind if I don't do any work, the taxpayer will never know, but make a show of working and get your back down to it. Molly Gruber looked about him a bit more, and gave a tentative bush at his broom, and then he wiped his nose with a horrid sound on his right sleeve, and said, "'You're asking the time, mister, if anybody says what you are saying to that there cleaner, but what I'm saying is this, no god ever came down here 
and done me brushing for me, me what's having my back breaking with bending over all day long and pushing all the dirt that people drops around, you never believe what I get down on my patch, pantyhose and other things, what goes in pantyhose, everything. You never believe what I find in these street corners. But as I was saying, no god ever came down here and pushed my brushes for me, never picked up any of the dirt on the roads for me. It's all my poor honest self what can't get a better job that's got to do it. The man making the inquiry looked sideways at Molly Groob and said, Bit of a pessimist, aren't you? Bet you're an atheist. Atheist? said Molly Gruber. No, I'm no atheist. Me mother was Spanish and my father was Russian, and I was born in Toronto. I don't know what makes me, but I still ain't no atheist. I don't know where the place is, anyhow. The questioner laughed and said, An atheist is a man who doesn't believe in a religion, doesn't believe in anything except the present. He's here now, and he dies, and he's gone. Where? No one knows, but the atheist believes that when he dies, his body is just like the garbage you pick up. There, that's an atheist. Molly Gruber chuckled and replied, That's him, that's me. I got a new thing what I am now. I'm an atheist, and when the guys what works with me ask me what I am, I can always tell them, No, I'm no Russian, I'm no Spaniard, I'm an atheist. And then they'll go away chuckling. They'll think old Molly Gruber got a bit of wit left in him after all. The questioner moved on. What's the point of wasting time talking to an old creep like this, he thought. Strange how all these street cleaners, street orlies they call themselves now, are so ignorant, and yet they really are a fount of knowledge about people who live in the district. He stopped suddenly and struck himself in the forehead with his open hand. Fool that I am, he said, I was trying to find out about that fellow. So he turned and went back to where old Molly Gruber was still standing in contemplation, apparently trying to emulate the statue of Venus, except that he didn't have the right form, the right sex, or the right implements. A broom wasn't a very good thing to pose with, after all. The questioner went up to him and said, Say, you work round here, you know about people who live around here. How about this? You showed him a five-dollar bill. I want to know about the fellow in the wheelchair, he said. Molly Gruber's hand shot out and grabbed the five-dollar bill and snatched it from the questioner's hand almost before he knew it was gone. Know about that old fellow? asked Molly Gruber. Why, sure I know about him. He lives down there somewhere. He goes to that alleyway, and then he goes down, and then he turns right. That's where he lives. Been living there for about two years now. Don't see him about much. He's got an illness to his terminals or something, but they say he ain't going to live much longer. He writes books. They He's called Rampa, and the things he writes about, they're just plain ridiculous. Life after death. He's no atheist. But they do say a lot of people reads his stuff. You can see a whole display of his books in that store down there. They sell a lot of them. Funny how some people makes money so easy, just by writing out a few words, and I've got to sweat my guts out pushing this broom, ain't it? The questioner said, Can you find out just where he lives? He lives in that apartment building, you say. But tell me, find out for me, where does he live? You tell me the apartment number, and I'll come back here tomorrow, and if you've got the apartment number, and you've got what time he comes out about, then I'll give you ten dollars. Molly Gruber ruminated a bit, took off his hat and scratched his head, then pulled the lobes of his ears. His friends would say they'd never seen him do that before, but Molly Gruber only did it when he was thinking, and, as his friends would tell him, he never thought much. But he could put in a bit of effort at thinking if there was ten dollars to be made for so little work. Then he spat and said, Mister, you got a deal. You shake hands at it, and you come here tomorrow at this very same time, and I'll tell you the number of where he lives, and when he comes out, and if he don't come out earlier. But I got a friend what knows the caretaker there. They packs up the garbage together. The garbage comes out of those big blue things, you see. Well, my friend, he'll find out for me, and if you like to spring a bit more, I could find out some more things for you. The questioner raised his eyebrows a bit and shuffled his feet and then said, 
Well, does he send out garbage, letters, things like that? Oh, no, no, said Molly Gruber. I know this. He's the only one in this street that got a thing what cuts up all his papers. He learned that trick back in Ireland. Some of those press people got hold of some papers of his, and he's a guy, so they say, who doesn't make the same mistake twice. He got a thing what turns out letters which look like strips of confetti stuff which hasn't been cut up in pieces. Comes out in ribbons. I've seen it myself in green garbage bags. Can't find any garbage for you because they're very careful out there. They don't leave nothing to chance that they never turn out a thing which can be traced. Okay, then, said the questioner. I'll be around here tomorrow at the self-same time and, as promised, I'll give you ten dollars if you can give me the apartment number and about what time he can be intercepted when he comes out. So long. And with that the questioner half lifted his hand in greeting and moved on his way. Molly Gruber stood still, so still that one would have thought he was indeed a statue, thinking it all over, trying to work out how many pints he could get for ten dollars. Then, slowly, he shuffled along pushing his old barrow and making a pretense of brushing up rubbish from the road as he went. Just then a man in black clerical dress swung around the corner and almost fell over old Molly Gruber's barrow. "'Hey there, hey there!' exclaimed Molly Gruber crossly. "'Don't you go and upset all my garbage. I've spent all the morning loading it into that barrow of mine.' The parson brushed off some specks from his jacket and looked down at old Molly Gruber. "'Ah, my good man,' he said, "'you are the very man who can help me. I am the new incumbent to this district, and I want to go on visitations. Can you tell me of new people in this area?' Old Molly Gruber put his finger and his thumb to his nostrils, bent over, and did a hearty blow, clearing his nostrils and just missing the feet of the parson, who looked shocked and disgusted. "'Visitations, is it?' said the old garbage man. "'I always thought that visitations were what the devil did. He visits us with visitations, and then he comes out in pebbles and boils and all that.' Oh, we've just paid our last cents for a pint, and somebody knocks it out of our hands. That's why I thought visitations was. The parson looked him up and down with real distaste. My man, my man, he said, I would surmise that you have not been inside a church for a very long time, for you are singularly disrespectful to the brethren of the cloth. Old Molly Gruber looked him back straight in the eye and said, no, mister, I ain't no God's boy. I just been told right what I am. I'm an atheist, that's what I am. And he smirked alarmingly as he said it. The parson shifted from foot to foot and looked about him. And then he said, But, my good man, you must have a religion. You must believe in God. You come to church on Sunday, and I will have a sermon specially for you, one of my unfortunate brothers, who is to sweep garbage for a living. Molly Gruber leaned complacently on the end of his broom and said, "'Ah, oh, now, parson, you'll never convince me that there is a God. Look at you there. You get a real packet of money, that I know, and all you do is shoot out some words about a thing that doesn't exist. You prove to me, Mr. Parson, that there is a God. Bring him here and let me shake hands with him. No God has ever done anything for me.' He stopped and fidgeted about in his pockets until he found a half-smoked cigarette. Then he flicked a match out of his pocket and struck it on his thumbnail before continuing. My mother, she was one of those dames what does it, you know what I mean for money? Never did know who my father was. Probably a whole gang of fellows responsible, really. But I've had to fight my way since I was a little lad knee-high to a grasshopper, and nobody's never done aught for me, so don't you, from your comfortable house and your comfortable job and your great big car, preach to me about God, come and do my job on the street first, and then see what your God does for you. Old Molly Gruber, snorted with rage, jerked into action with unaccustomed speed. He swept his broom onto the top of his barrow, grabbed the handles of the barrow, and almost trotted down the road. The parson looked after him with an expression of utter surprise in his face, and then he shook his head and walked off muttering, "'Good gracious me, good gracious me, what an ungodly man! 
What has the world come to? Later in the day, Molly Gruber got huddled up close with a couple of janitors, cleaners, managers, call them what you will, of some of the apartments around. They had a habit of meeting like that and exchanging juicy bits of knowledge. In his own way, Molly Gruber was one of the most knowledgeable men on the block. He knew everybody's movements, he knew who was going to apartments and who was coming out. So then he said to one of the men, Who's that old fellow in the wheelchair? Writer, ain't he? The caretakers turned to look at him, and one laughed out loud and said, Don't tell me you're interested in books, old fellow. I thought you were above all those things. Anyway, this guy's writing something about what they call thanatology. Don't quite know what it is myself, but I did hear some back talk about it being how you live when you die. Seems ridiculous to me, but there it is. Yes, he lives up at our place. Molly Gruber rolled his cigarette in his mouth and squinted down his nose and said, Good apartment he got, eh? But it's all dot up with the latest. I'd like to see inside one of those places myself. The caretaker smiled and said, Nope, you're wrong there. They live very modestly out there. You don't have to believe all he writes, mind. But I do say as how he lives what he preaches. He's looking pretty bad enough to soon be going to see the truth of this Thanato something that he writes about. Where does he live? What apartment, I mean? said Molly Gruber. The caretaker looked about him and said, Oh, it's a very secret, secret thing. People don't get to know his number, but I know where he lives. And what do you know about it, eh? Molly Gruber said nothing and then went about their ordinary desultory conversation for a time, and then he said, Did you say nine nine oh something his apartment? The caretaker laughed and said, I know you're trying to trick me, you sly old dog, but as it's you, I'll tell you what his number is. It's just at that moment one of the garbage trucks rattled into the lane and the automatic loader came into action, and the whining noise drowned out what the caretaker was saying. But being wise where money was concerned, Molly Gruber picked up an empty cigarette packet and fished out a pencil, saying, Here you are, write it on there. I won't tell who gave it to me. Obligingly but rather wondering what the old cleaner was up to, the caretaker did so and passed it back to Molly Gruber, who glanced at it, touched his hand to his head and slipped the packet in his pocket. I have to be going now, said the caretaker. Got to push out a few of these containers. It's our turn to get cleaned out next. See you. With that he turned and went back into the garbage room of his building. Old Molly Gruber walked on. Soon the garbage truck came around and two men got out, grabbed Molly Gruber's barrow and lifted it up to the back of the truck. Get in, old fellow, said one of the men, the driver maybe, and we'll drive you back to the depot. Molly Gruber got in, not minding at all that he was about fifteen minutes early, and back they drove to the garbage disposal station. "'Say, you fellows,' said Molly Gruber, "'do you know the writer named Ramper on my beat?' "'Yes,' said one of the men. "'We collect a lot of stuff from his block. He sure does seem to spend a lot on medication. We get an awful lot of empty cartons, bottles and the like, and I see now he's been having a lot of injections or something. He's got needles, what's marked tuberculin. Don't know what it is, but that's what they're marked. Had to stop a caretaker, a relief one, from getting in touch with the police, because how come anyone would want these things? Is the old fellow taking drugs, they wondered? The garbage collector stopped while he carefully rolled a cigarette. Then, when he was quite satisfied, he resumed, Never did believe in people getting in touch with the police on wild cases. I mind a way back, last year it was, there was a real humdinger of a fuss. A relief caretaker found an old oxygen cylinder among the garbage, and in spite of the cylinder being quite, quite empty, without even a valve on it, she got in touch with the police, she got in touch with the hospitals, until eventually, after a lot of trouble, it was found there was a perfectly legal explanation. After all, people don't have oxygen cylinders unless they're real, do they? They glanced up and quickly jumped into activity. It was a minute past the hour. They were working overtime and not getting paid for it. 
Quickly, quickly, they tore off their overalls, put on their everyday jackets, and rushed off to their cars to spend an idle time lounging around the street corners. Next morning, Molly Gruber was a little late getting to work. As he moved into the depot to get his barrow, a man gave him a hearty greeting from the cab of an incoming truck. "'Hey, Molly!' he shouted. "'Here's something for you. You've been asking so much about the guy. Here's something while he writes. Get your head into it.' And with that, he tossed a paperback book at Molly Gruber. The title was, I Believe. I believe, muttered Molly Gruber. Don't give me none of that rot. When you're dead, you're dead. Nobody's ever going to come along to me and say, Hi, Molly Gruber, you done pretty well in your life, old man. Here's a special throne made for you out of old garbage cans. But he turned the book over in his hands, fumbled through a few pages, and then shoved it into an inside pocket. "'What are you doing there, Molly Gruber? What are you stealing now?' A coarse voice asked, and out of a little office a squat, thick-set man emerged, extended his hand, and said, "'Give!' Molly Gruber slightly unbuttoned the top button of his jacket and fished out the paperback book, then passed it over. "'Hmm,' said the superintendent or foreman, or whatever he was. "'So you're going in for this type of thing now, eh?' "'Thought you didn't believe in anything except your pints in your pay packet?' Molly Gruber smiled up at the squat man, who, although short, was still taller than Molly Gruber, and said, "'Aye, aye, boss, you get a load of that book yourself and see if you can tell me how they make out, if there's any life after this. If I go along and I see a fish head in the corner of one of the lanes, I picks it up. That fish head, and nobody's ever going to tell me the fish is going to live again. He turned and spat expressively on the floor. The superintendent turned the book over and over in his hands, and then said slowly, Well, you know, Molly Gruber, there's a lot of things about life and death we don't understand at all. My missus, she's a real soul of this fella. She's read all his books and she swears that what he writes about is the truth and nothing but. My wife's a bit of a seer, you know. She's had a few experiences, and when she talks about him, it sure scares the hell out of me. In fact, only a couple of nights ago, she frightened me so much about the ghost she claims to have met that I went out and had a drink or two, and then a drink or two too many. And by the time I got home that night, well, I was afraid of my own shadow, but get on with your work, lad. Get down to your beat. You're late. I won't book you out this time because I've been delaying you myself, but get a move on. Make one foot get in front of the other a bit faster than usual. Git. So old Molly Gruber grabbed his barrow, made sure it was empty, made sure the brush was his, and off he ambled down the road, starting another day as a street garbage collector. It was boring work, all right. A whole bunch of school kids had come by and left their filthy litter in the gutters. Old Molly Gruber muttered cross imprecations as he bent down to pick up toffee papers, chocolate papers and all the litter which a bunch of kids make. But his little banner was soon full. He stopped a while, leaned on the end of his broom and watched some building construction. Then, tiring of that, he moved on to something else. A broken-down car was being towed away. Then a clock struck, and Molly Gruber straightened up a bit, shifted the cigarette to the other side of his mouth, and moved off down to the shelter in the little park. Lunchtime. He liked to go in there and have his lunch away from the people who sat on the grass outside, just making more litter for him. He walked down the road, pushing his barrow before him. Then, reaching the little shelter, he fished a key out of his pocket and unlocked the side door, and in he went. With a sigh of relief, he pushed his barrow out of the way and sat down on a load of flower crates, crates in which flowers of the garden had been packed. He was just rummaging about his lunch pail for his savages when a shadow fell across the doorway. He looked up and saw the man he had been hoping to see. The thought of the money greatly attracted him. The man walked into the shelter and sat down. He said, "'Well, I have come for the information you are getting for me.' As he spoke, he got out his wallet and fiddled about with the notes. Old Molly Gruber looked at him dourly and said, "'Well, who be you, mister? We street orderlies don't just give information to anybody who comes along, you know. 
we got to know who we're dealing with. With that, he took a hearty bite at one of the sandwiches, and the squashed tomato, pips and all, came spurting out. The man sitting on the boxes opposite hastily jumped out of the way. What could the man tell about himself? Could he say that anyone would have known that he was an Englishman and a product of Eton, even though he had been to Eton for only rather less than a week through an unfortunate mistake when, during the darkness of one night, he had mistaken the wife of one of the housemasters for one of the roommates with quite disastrous consequences. So he had been expelled almost before he had arrived, thus establishing some sort of a record. But he liked to claim that he had been to Eton, and that was perfectly true. "'Who am I?' he said. "'I should have thought the whole world would know who I am. "'I am the representative of a most prestigious English publication, "'and I wanted the in-depth life story of this author. "'My name is Jarby Bumblecross.' "'Old Molly Gruber just sat there munching away, "'spraying sandwich all over the place, "'and mumbling to himself as he did so.' He had a cigarette in one hand and a sandwich in the other. First he would take a bite of the sandwich, then he would take a draw of the cigarette, and so on. And then he said, Jarvie, eh? That's a new name to me. How come? The man thought for a moment, and then decided that there was no harm in telling this fellow. After all, he would probably never see him again. So he said, I belong to an old English family which goes back for many generations, and many years ago my maternal great-grandmother eloped with a cabman in London. In those days cabmen were called Jarvies, and so to commemorate what was a rather unfortunate affair, male members of the family have had the name of Jarvie ever since. Old Molly Gruber thought it over for a time, and then said, So you want to write about this fellow's life, do you? Well, by what I've been hearing, he's had too much written about his life. Seems to me from what the other fellows and I have heard that you pressmen are making life a misery for him and his likes. He's never done any harm to me. And look at this now. He extended one of his sandwiches. Look at it. Dirty newsprint all over the bread. How am I supposed to eat that? What's the good of buying these papers if you don't use an ink which stays put? Never did like the taste of newsprint. The man was getting crosser and crosser by the minute. He said, Do you want to impede the work of the mass media? Do you know that they have a perfect right to go anywhere, to enter anywhere, and to question anyone? I was being very generous in offering you money for your information. It is your duty to give it freely to a member of the press. Old Molly Gruber had a sudden flush of rage. He couldn't stick this smooth-talking Englishman who thought he was one higher than God himself, so he rose to his feet, saying, Get your gun, mister. Get yourself off. Beat it. Scram. Mosey, or I'll pack you in my barrow and take you back to the depot for the other fellows to give you a working over. He grabbed up a leaf rake, and advanced to the man, who got up quickly, moved backwards, and tripped over all the crates. He went down in what seemed to be a welter of arms and legs and flying wood. But he did not stay down. One look at old Molly Gruber's face, and he was up in a flash, and he did not stop running for quite a time. Old Molly Gruber moved slowly around, picking up crates and odd pieces of wood, mumbling irritably to himself, "'Jervy cab driver, what sort of yarn do they expect me to believe?' And if he had a great-grandmother, or whoever it was, married a cab-driver, then how come this fellow is such a stupid dope? Ah, for sure, he went on, his face getting dark and dark with anger. It must be because he's an Englishman that he's got this manner. He sat down again, and had a go at the second lot of sandwiches. But no, he was too angry to continue, so he bundled the rest of his food back into his lunch-pail, and went out to the park to get a drink from the tap there. He moved about looking at the people, after all this was his lunchtime, and then around the corner of a path where there had been hidden by a tree two parsons approached. "'Ah, my good man,' said one, "'can you tell me where there are um, uh, public facilities for men?' Old Molly Gruber, in a bad mood, said, "'Nay, there ain't none of them things here. You've got to get off to one of them hotels and say you've got to do it in a hurry.' You come from England, where they have them in the streets. Well, we don't have them here. You'll have to go to a gas station or a hotel or the like. 
How extraordinary, how extraordinary, said one of the parsons to the other, some of these Canadians seem to be intensely averse to we of England. They went off in some haste to get up to the hotel just a block further on. Just then there were screams coming from the direction of the little lake in the centre of the garden. Molly Gruber turned in a hurry to see what was the excitement. He walked down the path toward the pond and saw a small child of about three floating in the water. Her head kept going under the water and bobbing up again. Around the side of the little pond, a group of onlookers stood idly, no one making the slightest attempt to go to the rescue and pull the child out. Old Molly Gruber could move fast sometimes. He did now. He charged forward and knocked some old woman flat on her back, and another went reeling sideways. Molly Gruber jumped over the little stone wall and floundered through the shallow water. As he did so, his foot slipped on some slime at the bottom of the pond, and he went down head first, cutting his scalp rather badly. But he got up, scooped up the child in his hands, and held her upside down as if to pour out the water from her. Having done that, he stepped gingerly along the slippery bottom and then climbed over the wall again to dry land. A woman came rushing towards him, yelling, Where's her hat? Where's her hat? It was a new one. I, I just bought it at the bay. You'd better get it. Molly Gruber crossly thrust the child, so wet and dripping, in her mother's arms. The woman reeled back to think of her dress being spoiled by the water. Old Molly Gruber moved on back to his little shelter. For some time he stood there, glumly with water leaking down his clothes and oozing into his shoes and overflowing out on the floor. But then, he thought, he didn't have any clothes to change into. It would be all right, though his clothes would soon dry on him. Wearily he grabbed the handles of the barrow, moved out with it, and locked the door after him. He shivered because a cold wind had come blowing from the north, and everyone knows that a wind from the north is a cold wind indeed. Old Molly Gruber shivered and went to work a bit harder in an attempt to generate some warmth and so dry out his clothes. Soon he began to perspire freely, but his clothes didn't seem to be drying much. He was slopping and squelching along, and it seemed to be an absolute eternity until at last the time came for him to go back to the depot. The other men were somewhat astonished at old Molly Gruber's silence. "'What's wrong with old Molly?' asked one. He looks as if he lost a dollar and found a cent. Not like him to be so quiet, is it? Wonder what happened. His old car was hard to start, and then just as he did start and was ready to drive off, he found that one of his rear tyres was flat. So, with a very loud curse, he stopped the engine, got out, and went through the laborious task of changing his wheel. With that done, he got into his car again, and once more experienced some great difficulty in getting the thing started. By the time he got home to his lonely room, he was sick of the whole thing, sick of saving people, sick of work, sick of loneliness, sick of everything. Quickly he peeled off his clothes, mopped himself dry with an old towel, and climbed into bed without bothering to have anything more to eat. In the night he found that he was sweating profusely, the night seemed to be endless. He was having difficulty in breathing, and his body seemed to be on fire. He lay there in the darkness, breathing harshly, and wondering whatever could be wrong with him, but thinking that in the morning he would go along to the drugstore and get some cough tablets or something to ease the trouble in his chest. Morning was long a-coming, but at last the red rays of the sun shone in his small window to find him still awake with a red face and a burning temperature. He tried to get up, but collapsed on the floor. How long he stayed there, he did not know, but eventually he was awakened to the movements. He opened his eyes, and looked up and found two ambulance men just lifting him onto a stretcher. "'Double pneumonia, that's what you got, old man,' said one of the ambulance men. "'We're taking you to the general. You'll be all right,' the other said. "'Any relatives? Do you want us to get in touch with them?' Old Molly Gruber closed his eyes in weariness and lapsed into a troubled sleep. He did not know when he was carried out to the ambulance, he did not know when the ambulance drove into the hospital emergency entrance, nor when he was carried up to a ward and put into a bed.